classes uh, and, and even some of our alums. So, uh, and lots of new friends and, and faces and names. So we are very excited to have you here today. So I'm gonna turn it over to my wonderful doctoral student and graduate assistant, Sierra Harris. And Sierra is gonna get us started uh, and we'll go right into our speaker. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here and to be kicking off critical conversations in LIS with you all. Like Dr. Cook said, my name is Sierra. I'm a PhD student in the Library and Information Science program. And before we get started, I just wanna go over some quick Zoom housekeeping. Today's session will be recorded and the recording will be sent out to every registered guest at the end of the, at the conclusion of the session. We just ask that you mute yourself, but utilize the chat to ask questions and engage with us throughout. There will be a time where you'll be encouraged to unmute yourself and ask questions, but let's get to why you're here. I have the pleasure, the immense pleasure of introducing Ms. Carrie Banks. Carrie Banks has been in charge of the Brooklyn Public Library's Inclusive Services since 1997 mm -hmm. and taught including youth with disabilities at Pratt Institute from 2013 to 2015. Active in the Association of Specialized and Cooperative Library Agencies and the Association for Library Services to Children since 2000, she was the president of AS. GCLA in 2020, and from 2017 to 2019, she was part of the ALA President Leota Garcia Feebles EDI presidential team. In 2014, she substantially revised, including families of children with special needs, a how to do it manual for librarians, libraries and garden growing together, written with Cynthia Media Media Villa, and was published in the spring of 2019, Library Programming for Adults with de Developmental Disabilities, written with Barbara Clipler, which will be published, or which was published in spring mm -hmm. of 2021. So please, let's all welcome Ms. Carrie Banks. Thank you so much, Sierra and Dr. Cook. It's such a pleasure to be here. I am going to share my screen. Okay. Takes a minute. I see uh, people found the um, the captions button. Oops. And this, of course. Uh, okay. Sorry, the um, the buttons are covered. Okay. And here we go. So um, this is, uh, I am Carrie Banks and this is Inclusive Services at Brooklyn Public Library. And we're going to be talking also about universal design for learning, which is how we make our services inclusive. And by inclusive, I mean for use with and without disabilities. Um, this is a picture of our kids mobile um, with two book trucks in front of it and a, a black man and child standing in front of it. Um, the man is taller than the service window and the child is shorter than the book truck. And uh, he is handing the child their library card. So today we're gonna to talk about a culture of inclusion and then we're gonna talk about inclusive services. So as far as I'm concerned, and there are certainly different uh, opinions on this, a culture of inclusion has three, uh, three aspects. So there's the social model of disability, universal design for learning, and culturally appropriate practices. Social model of disability is a different way of looking at the world. Um, traditionally, we, when we think about disability and when society talks about disabilities, it's usually from a lens of the medical model, right? So that there is something wrong with the individual, right? Um, I have physical disabilities and difficulty, I use a cane, I have difficulty, I can't really climb stairs. So in the medical model of the disability, I'm the problem, there's something wrong with me. In the social model of the disabilities, there's something wrong with the building that only has stairs, no ramps and no elevators. So this shifts the onus from the individual and um, to society. When we're thinking about barriers um, to fully accessing society, um, we think about environmental barriers like those stairs, attitudinal barriers, and this, as far as I'm concerned, is just the biggest. Um, 
uh, the refusal to treat people with disabilities with respect and to welcome them into, um, into society and think of them in the same way that we think of anybody else. Um, and then we call that ableism. There are governmental barriers. I don't even want to start there. I'm sure many of you are aware of them, but one of the places they start with is the complete inaccessibility of the benefit system that are supposed to exist for people with disabilities. Um, and then organizational barriers. And those are um, just sort of the, the things that our institutions like our libraries um, unintentionally most of the time um, do to that prevent people from accessing our services. So um, one example of that might be the th uh, three-week loan period. We have a three-week loan period here at Brooklyn Public Library. And for someone with dyslexia, um, that might not be enough time to finish a book, right? So there are so many things at so many different levels um, that create those barriers, but it is society creating those barriers and not the individual. Mm -hmm. So um, I think somebody there is not muted. Okay, so okay, so if we're going to change how we look at things, right? Um, how are we going to make them more more accessible? How do we change our libraries? How do we change our ways of thinking about these things? And for me, that's universal design for learning. Universal design for learning is adapted from architecture, and I often show a picture of a. a of a set of stairs with a ramp winding through it for this picture, um, because it demonstrates how we can intentionally design something so that it works for people who like climbing stairs, people who want to climb stairs, people who can climb stairs, and also for people who don't want to or can't, or are pushing a stroller or a shopping cart. We do a lot of that in New York City. Um, but it's designed for use by everybody. And that's the important aspect here, it's universal. When we take that concept from architecture and apply it to education, we need to, we are looking at three different um, networks, if you will, or three different um, modalities of, of thinking. So the first is representation. Um, and that's how we put the material, the information out there that we wanna share with people. And we want to use is multiple means of representation or flexible ways to present what we teach and learn. And I'm taking that directly from the illustration I have on the um, on the slide. So when I taught, um, and not so much in in this virtual setting um, where time is short, but when I taught and I was presenting something like the concept of universal design for learning, um, I would always give different types of examples, right? So first, of course, we have the visual, um, and we're gonna get to that here in a minute, but then also by speaking it, which is verbal, and then we would interact around it, we would have a discussion, um, and that's another way to present the material to let people process it as they're learning about it. So there are all kinds of different ways, and we're gonna revisit this in a minute. Um, then the second area, so there's representation, but then we need to hear from the people who are learning or the people who are taking in the information, right? So we need to have multiple ways of, uh, multiple means of action and expression. So that's flexible options for how we express what we learn and what we know. So when I was in high school, um, I had a classmate who was a gifted composer and musician. So for our capstone projects of high school, um, we had, or of ninth grade, we had, we all had capstone projects, and his was um, a very deep, in-depth, detailed look at the Battle of Pearl Harbor, um, and where I wrote a paper for my project, and I don't even remember what it was on at this point. Um, Harry uh, wrote music and choreographed a dance that represented what happened um, during the Battle of Pearl Harbor, and um, and I he and I and a couple of other students, we, we danced that. And it astounded me at the time, and it still sort of does, that he could express so much information um, and with it, feelings um, with that dance. It was, it was just amazing. But that's an example of multiple means of expression and action. 
And another side to that is communication. We don't all communicate verbally. Um, many of the, the children that I work with are nonverbal. Um, they use picture exchange communication systems where they use sign language. Um, and it's important as a librarian for us to accept those forms of communication. We're going to circle back to this too. And then finally, there's engagement, right? So uh, we want people to learn things. We want people to access things, um, but they may not. And some of us are teachers, right? We need to teach things. But are the people that we want to share with may not necessarily be interested in what we're sharing. So how do we reach them? And we do that by engaging them um, with engaging in the things that they are interested in, right? So this is multiple means of engagement and we call it flexible options for generating and sustaining motivation or the why of learning. So you can teach probability in a whole bunch of different ways, right? You can teach probability through uh, equations and charts. You can teach it by talking someone through it. You can teach probability by talking about seeds, right? Or even experimenting with seeds, right? So you have five seemingly identical seeds and you plant them in seemingly identical mm -hmm. containers, right? But maybe only four of those are gonna grow. And repeating those kinds of things is, uh, so that's gonna interest somebody in probability who might be more interested in playing mm -hmm. outdoors or being in a garden. Um, uh, or foul shot, someone who is really interested in, or as an athlete or is interested in sports, right? You can teach probability by talking about foul shots. Same person stains the same line with the same ball and the same hoop and throws 10 baskets, how many of them go in? And that's an example. Those are examples of, of engaging people where they are and bringing them to where you want, to be, where you want them to be. So that's the what um, representation, the how, action, expression, and engagement of universal design for learning. Okay. So I said we'd circle back to representation and this is what multiple means of representation might look like in a library. I started with a book I hope we all know, right? The Very Hungry Caterpillar. So um, there are different ways to represent that story, right? One is uh, with the book and you see an example of the board book in the middle on the bottom line there. Um, and, but so that's, that's the words and the pictures on your traditional book. And um, whenever I do a book like this, I make sure that I have um, anatomically correct manipulatives to go along with it. So a, a strawberry that's shaped like a strawberry, a butterfly that's shaped like a butterfly. And that's what you see scattered around that particular book. Um, but there are other ways to represent that story too. If you look at the top left, you see a flannel board set for the very hungry caterpillar. And we can use that to storyboard um, the story. We can use it to engage kids physically. They can have them put things on the board or take them off. Um, and it's, it's more of a discussion, can be more of a discussion with our students than, um, than just reading the book. Then next to that, you see a, a basket with plush toys representing the different items in the book, the caterpillar, the butterfly, the pizza, the watermelon and all of that. So that's another way to represent the story. You can act it out like a puppet play. Then we have um, next to that, the Very Hungry Caterpillar in a adaptive communication format. So these, this particular format is a picture exchange communication system or PECS. And you see each of the key elements is represented by a picture with the word. And you can use those. Uh, and this one's actually a story storyboarded. So you can uh, use it to show uh, in conjunction with the book or, or just telling the story or any other way of representing it. Um, for someone who is nonverbal, this will support their learning um, and hearing the story. At the bottom on the far left, we have a Braille version of the book that also has tactile pictures. So it has two circles cut out and those are meant to represent the caterpillar. And then on the far right side, we already talked about the board book with the manipulatives. On the far right side, of course, is the very popular, um, very hungry, my very hungry caterpillar app, which also tells the same story. So those are the different ways we're representing the very hungry caterpillar. And we talked about engagement earlier, right? Or the, um, the, the why of learning. So for engagement, we wanna 
get learners who are interested in all kinds of things. I happen to be a baker, so I'm starting here with a baked Very Hungry Caterpillar or cupcakes uh, designed in the shape of the Very Hungry Caterpillar. Next to that is a maraca. Um, I'm sorry, no, a castanet, castanet with a picture of the Very Hungry Caterpillar on it that says, let's dance. So we can dance out that story, right? We can engage our, our, our patrons who are interested or who like to dance and move, who need to dance and move. We can engage them in the story uh, through dance and music, like my friend Harry. Um, then we have a puppet craft. So this gives us two things, right? This gives us the opportunity to act out the story, but also someone who's interested in arts or arts and crafts, a way for them to, um, to engage with the story. Uh, for our competitive patrons, we have the Very Hungry Caterpillar game, board game, or one of the many Very Hungry Caterpillar board games. Uh, and again, that's a way for someone who's more interested sort of in socializing than sitting down and reading a book, that's a way for them to enjoy the story um, and, uh, and engage with the story while talking. Um, one of my favorites, right? And this is a Lego, a ver this is a Lego version of the Very Hungry Caterpillar. Okay, so could you imagine like doing all those illustrations from the book in Lego? You'd really get an in-depth understanding of the story. And finally, a coloring book, which is a very popular option here at Brooklyn Public Library. So now we're back to the how of, um, yeah, how of learning. And that's multiple means of action and expression. Right? So people communicate in different ways. Um, we all know that from daily experience, but I don't think we think about it enough. So here we have um, an example of uh, two people signing to, I think, they're teens, they're certainly black, and they are having a good time signing to each other. Next to that uh, is a East Asian woman uh, dancing traditional Indian dances. She, and she, there are pictures of the pose for earth and for water. And below that is a young man um, with dark skin and he is using one of those picture exchange communication systems on an iPad. And certainly these aren't the only ways that people communicate, um, people write, talk gestures that are not sign language. Um, we point to things and all of these are ways of communication um, and action and expression. Just like that, the dance and music was for, for Harry, back to my original example. So it's a lot to take in, right? But I got a checklist. Um, and that's multiple intelligence theory. While there are uh, pluses and minuses certainly to the theory, and it hasn't been as well validated as people hoped it would be in the beginning. What it does do is give us a simple, an easy checklist to make sure that we are covering all those ways of engagement and, uh, and communication and representation. So um, I'm going to go back to probability, I think, and let's talk through how the different ways that we can uh, teach or share about probability probability in a program. I, I say teach there because I think mostly people teach math rather than sharing math, which is a real shame because math is totally amazing. And if we were in person, I would ask how many of you hate math and all, most of the um, and most of the women would raise their hands. A lot of the men would too. And I got to tell you, um, if you hate math, it's because you had a bad teacher. My son is a, was a math teacher. Um, and love math, he was just love math, but he would always say to me, it's because I had a bad teacher. And when he finally sat down with me and said, okay, look, math is why the airplane flies. Um, and, and math is, is this and that, then I kind of got it. And I did have bad math teachers. It was an all girls school and they didn't expect us to learn math. Okay, so, um, so we're gonna go back to probability. How do we teach probability using a, uh, in these different ways. So our first one is nature smart or um, a naturalist intelligence. And the, the example of the seeds is the way to, um, to share about probability with nature. Uh, people smart or uh, interpersonal intelligence as he call, as uh, Armstrong calls it. And that's a harder one to sort of for this because it, oh, sorry, it seems to be advancing uh, on its own. Okay, this is a harder one because it's, um, but you could, people watch, just sit on a, a street corner and watch how many people in red shirts, how many people in sneakers, um, and that, you know, apply probability to that. So what's the probability that the next one's going to be in a red shirt or sneakers? Um, number smart, and this is probability. So again, we're going to use those graphs. We're going to use those equations for that. Someone who's interested in art, you know, we could do all kinds of different things, but um, 
patterns are and, and the recurrence of patterns. We can look at those. We can see how, um, you know, mosaic, for example, what's how many times a certain the ratio of colors to each other. And so what's the probability in the next section of the mosaic that it's going to have this color or that. Um, Self-smart uh, or interpersonal intelligence. And this is just allowing people to have time to think and process the inter information. So you can present it in all these ways um, and then sort of let people internalize it and connect it to their feelings. Uh, I, this is one way to think of that too. Um, body smart, these are people who move and there's, um, I actually, I, I was sharing this at the um, Brooklyn Academy of Music and I was stuck on the body smart one and they're like, oh, that's easy. We could do dance rhythms. And how often does this particular rhythm show up in the dance? Um, and then what's, what's, what are the chances it's gonna show up in the next section of the dance? Um, and music, you can do a similar thing with looking for musical themes and, and plotting those. And, um, and words might, if we're going to teach this probability with words, then we're just going to talk about it and explain it with words. So that's how I use um, multiple intelligences checklists here at, or how we use them here at um, Brooklyn Public Library at Inclusive Services. And excuse me, just for a minute. This is one of the disadvantages of doing these things virtually. I don't get to take a break, a break, ask you questions, and sneak in a sip of water in the meantime. So this is what universal design looks like here once we've gone through that, that multiple intelligence checklist. So our book today is Caps for Sale. It is on the um, it's on a uh, an easel, a book truck easel um, in the front of this picture. Um, it's at the edge of a carpet, and then you see uh, cube chairs around the carpet um, facing the easel. And then we have Zadine's chair next to the carpet. Zadine, who is um, our, one of our programming specialists, is not actually sitting in the chair. And there are no kids in the seats. Um, at the bottom of the easel book cart is a picture schedule using those PECs or picture exchange communication system I mentioned. Um, and each of the chairs has a hat on it. So the hats are for both our interpersonal learners um, to, who can sort of act out the story through the hats um, and also for our kinesthetic learners or our musical learn, uh, I'm sorry, our physical learners, they can put the hats on, experiment, they can throw them up in the air. It's a way to engage them with the stories. Um, and I know that Zidine had some music planned for this. I know she's gonna um, talk to them about the hat the hats and the storyline and get them to talk to each other. Um, and then there is a musical component to that and that's tied to the second book of the story, um, Tap the Tap Tap. And then, okay, so we've got several different ways, several different uh, ways of engaging with, with that story. The story itself leads toward, leads itself to nature as, um, we've got trees and we've got monkeys and is this how monkeys really act in nature or not is this you know you can engage them with the story that way so we've got a whole variety of ways of reaching our audiences where they already are and bringing them to um to the story of the very hungry caterpillar then and so then I thought we were going to talk about some cultural issues here, right? We're still looking at the barriers, society's barriers and, and our barriers that we are creating and allowing in the library. So some of the issues um, are the youth are using libraries are coming up with some of the cultural issues are pronouns, right? Uh, people mm -hmm. want to impose pronouns. Um, students in our youth are often faced with having to demand that the pro their preferred pronouns be used and and it's and they are often not particularly in our schools and there's the I think it's um, getting worse than it was the language and the way that we talk about people um, I just saw a recent post um, on ban the R word and the R word is um, is retarded it's a word that's very commonly used in our society um, and it's very, very offensive to people with intellectual disabilities. So, um, but it's still out there. There's been that, that campaign for ban the R word's been going on for over 10 years. And, you know, it just popped up again as, oh, this came up in this uh, national me media 
uh, source and we need to keep talking about this. So we need to be aware of the language that we are using, make sure it's not ableist language. Um, and then we can't make uh, assumptions about people, right? So not everybody with autism is the same, not everybody with a learning disability is the same. And so when somebody, when a patron says, oh, I have dyslexia or I have learning disabilities, uh, we assume that they are gonna want audio books, um, that they're going to maybe want um, a graphic novel, right? Or that they can't read. Okay, but rather than assuming, we, we need to ask the patrons what they need. So I actually have learning disabilities. I've got a lot of experience here. And primarily, and I do read audiobooks, I'm no good with graphic novels. Um, but my issues primarily are with writing. So if you say, oh, it's going to be at 398.2, here, write that down. I can't write it down. And if I manage to write it down, it's going to be useless to me because it's going to be completely illegible. So, but people make those assumptions all the time, especially of a librarian. Everybody assumes that librarians can read and write. I don't get it. Um, and then also in terms of cultural issues, we need to be thinking, and I, this, thank goodness, we're becoming much more aware of, but we need to be thinking about um, the where our patrons are and making sure that we have material for them. Nancy Drew is up there because um, I lost my mother as a child. I was six. Uh, and Nancy Drew for a very long time were the only books I liked to read because they were only books at that time in the mid mid 1960s that had a single father and I was being raised by a single father. So they were the ones that interested me in and that I could identify with and that validated me. So there is, um, we need diverse books. Uh, we need diverse books is a great website and, and resource for this. And I think our profession is much more aware of this than we used to be. The need to represent the youth that we're serving in our books and to make sure, not just that the youth that we're serving, but they're seeing other people too, not just the ones that look like themselves. The first picture, the little um, meme going on on the screen there is a young woman flapping her hands. Um, she is autistic and she does that to uh, regulate, self-regulate, right? To bring herself to, herself to a place of homeostasis and help her manage her emotions and her sensory input. In many places and in many of our libraries, um, she would be asked to stop doing this, right? But why? What's wrong with her doing this? It's, in a screen like this, I know it's a little distracting. I wish I could stop it, but I can't. But what harm does it do in a library? It's not typical behavior, but it, there's no, it's not hurting anyone either. And when we're thinking about behavior in the library, we need to be thinking about those things and questioning why, what our rules are and who they're impacting um, and also how we're enforcing them. Um, and I could go on for hours about the library's role in the school to prison pipeline, but I'm gonna move on here because that's not the topic of this workshop per se. Um, so the next illustration on that slide is a, um, a square with squares in it. Um, it's like a tic-tac-toe board. It's got, it's three by three and it has uh, people with different color hairstyles, different color skins and different pronouns. And the pronouns represented are she, her, he, him, they, them, they, them, she, her, he, him, Z here, they, them, and she, her. Which reminds me, I did not tell you what my pronouns are when, we, when I started the, uh, started the presentation. I apologize for that. My, program, my pronouns are she and them. So, so what do we do about that? Well, we check ourselves, right? Am I doing this? Am I, um, am I penalizing somebody for behavior that's not really harmful? Um, in our programs, I once had a pro, I did a program for a class of students and um, they were all autistic and I knew that. And they were sitting there and there were six of them and um, I'm reading to them. They were young, maybe eight, nine years old. And, um, Five of them sat there nicely with their hands clasped in front of them. And the sixth one got up, walked to the back of the room and just walked in circles the whole time, mumbling to, to himself. Um, and I was like, okay, I've got a class of six. I reached five, I'm happy. The teacher called the next day and said that the, the young man that was walking in circles in the back of the room, uh, retold everybody on the bus, the two stories that I had, three stories that I had read to them, went, went back to school, told his, um, his 
PE teacher and then went home and told those same stories again, word for word to his, um, to his family. So he clearly um, was listening and paying attention, but not in a way that I understood. So there was kind of a cultural difference there, right? So we're talking about culturally appropriate practices in terms of disability issues. Um, we need to understand things like that, like the flapping and the, the walking, the constant motion and understand that um, those differences and that they're about the disabilities and we just need to accept them. We need to draw on the strengths of our community and they are many. Um, and we had uh, a different young man who was a teenager with autism and he used to lead programs at the library on things of interest to him, particularly the Battleship Intrepid and they were fairly well attended. Uh, we need to value our learners' cultures, their language, heritage and experience. Um, if somebody says that they want to, um, that they identify as dyslexic instead of a person with dyslexia, we need to accept that. It's not up to us to judge their, their identity or their ways of their culture. Um, or their ways of speaking about themselves. Uh, and the pictures go to valuing our learners' culture. Um, the two, the first one is the instructions for borrowing a book from, uh, uh, borrowing seeds from the seed library at the Cesar Chavez Library in the Oakland Public Library System. Um, they are in English and Spanish. And then below that is, uh, is Pete Via Senora. He is the librarian at the Cesar Chavez Library. He's the branch manager, and he is standing in front of um, in front of his container garden. These are large containers, as tall as he is, um, with trees in the top, um, and they are two tiered. But it's hard to see from the picture. But his the plants in those those gardens represent the communities that he served. Um, originally, it was almost exclusively Spanish speaking community, mostly from Mexico, um, but there are more English speakers there now, but there are also more Chinese speakers. So he has cilantro, he has parsley, he has um, uh, bok choy, he has those seeds in the seed library that people can borrow, but he also, they grow them in the garden now. So that's valuing the culture and language um, of our communities. We need to recognize those structural inequities and barriers and confront them. So just, and that's just that simple. We need to create affirming, inclusive and welcoming guide environments. And that gets back to that culture of inclusion and uh, among other things, like universal design for learning. But here's the thing, don't put the responsibility on your audience to teach you. Um, I think we are as a profession learning this, but we still, um, that being said, we also still need to ask people what they want and what they, you know, how, what their preferences are, right? Um, but we need to do our background research and, and have some ideas too, which you are all doing by being here. So thank you. And our materials. Um, this is, Romeo and Juliet is not the best example to use for this, but it's one of the few books uh, that I could find in multiple formats and enough formats to use this to demonstrate. So, um, so I apologize for using Romeo and Juliet, but it does illustrate um, our collections and their need to be diverse in, in format, right? So what we see here on the screen is an audiobook of Romeo and Juliet. Uh, in the middle there is a video game of Romeo and Juliet. Then we have the, the traditional leather bound folio of Romeo and Juliet. Next to that is an Osborne um, uh, easy reader version of Romeo and Juliet. Um, then we have the large print version and my favorite, the original text um, graphic novel version, which is how I first encountered Romeo and Juliet. And this is still taught in our school, so we do still have these, and it's an important to still have them in our libraries. So that's an example, again, of multiple means of representation, right, and, and what it means in our libraries. Diverse tools are critical. So when we're doing arts and crafts projects, a lot of places you just see them hand out um, coloring sheets and pencils. And when you're really stretched or coloring sheets and crayons, that's what you got to do. But we need to be thinking about the other ways that people are using um, our craft materials. So um, what we see here are pencils with different types of pencil grips on them. We see, this is one of my favorite things, foam dough. Um, and then it's a foam clay, actually. It's, it's, doesn't dry out, it, it's kind of sticky. So not everybody likes it, people with sensory issues, not always crazy about it, but it's kind of cool. I like it. 
the next to that are all the different ways you can adapt uh, paint, adapt brushes for painting, right? So you can put them through a, um, a ball, which creates a larger um, surface to hold. You can put them in a bottle. Um, you can use uh, specially designed brushes with large handles, and in this case, a sponge, um, sponge brush. Uh, a lotion jar provides a nice way to dispense paint too. And below that, we have adaptive scissors. Um, and then these are, these are squeeze scissors. Uh, they're easier um, for people who struggle with a pincer grip. They're easier to use. Sometimes they're easier for people to conceptualize, but they work well. And then my favorite, those cube chairs. Um, and they, you see how they have, diff what you see here is the different heights, right? So that um, they are engineered so that turned one way, it's a flat surface. Turned another way, you've got a deep chair that provides a lot of support on the sides and the back. And turned another way, you've got a slightly uh, a higher seat that um, only that gives minimal support to sides and back. And not only they can be can they be used as chairs, they can also be used as tables. So back to the uh, play materials um, are critical, right? Uh, Blocks are not just small little things, you know, made out of wood that we put one on top of the other. Blocks are sometimes soft, large, soft, squish, squishy things that are almost as large as the person who is using them. Um, sometimes they are alphabet block, blocks have textured illustrations, sketched, etched illustrations, or and braille. Uh, those particular blocks also have the uh, American so sign language sign for the concepts represented, seven or R. Um, in those cases. Uh, and then we have another example of blocks in the middle of that page, and those are sticky blocks. Uh, and they're easier to put together for people with fine motor skills. You think about music and instruments, right? Another way to go besides, there are lots of ways to go, and we're pretty good at providing a variety of types of instrument, but rain sticks are another thing that I like to throw in there because they're fun. When we're playing with toys, we're not all playing with toys the same way. And um, one of the pictures you see there is a young girl pushing a button that makes a mechanical toy go. And uh, I skipped over uh, the, our gamer and he is playing video games. He's sitting in a, in a wheelchair and he is using a chin switch to play chin switch and finger switches to play the game. And then finally, we have, um, I believe those are brat stalls, but they have disabilities. Um, one is using a cane and wears glasses, another has uh, hearing aids, and the third has a port wine stain, a hemangioma on her face. Again, that, that representation, making sure that our youth are seeing themselves in our collections and in all of our materials. When we're thinking about programming, um, moving on, uh, we need to think about structure and having visual schedules, using visual schedules helps children pay attention. It helps children, typically developing children pay attention and it helps um, children with processing issues and um, executive functioning issues such as autism or learning disabilities or ADHD. It helps them pay attention and anxiety disorder. So I don't know how many of you here are, you know, sat down and I got a couple of minutes into this and you were like, oh no, I forgot to go to the bathroom. Oh, well, I'll wait, but I don't know when I'm going to get a break. Oh no, when am I going to, is it going to come soon? Is it going to come later? Should I leave now? Oh no. Um, so when at the beginning I showed you what we were going to do and I outlined it for you and I didn't outline a break, right? So hopefully you got the idea that there was not going to be a break here. So you know, right, how to plan things. Um, and maybe don't have to worry about it. Like, okay, I'll wait to the end or no, I've got to go now. But it lessens the anxiety to know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And it allows you to plan uh, and self-regulate. So what you see here is a picture schedule, right? You have a, um, the first thing we do is we sing the hello song, Benvenido. Um, then we're going to leer, we're going to read a book. Then we're going to cantar, sing. Then we're going to leer, read another book. Then we're going to do manipulad manipuladas. Um, which is a terrible way of translating arts and crafts, but I've struggled to find a better way and I've asked lots of people. Uh, and then we're going to limpiar or clean up. And you see those things illustrated with the words and, um, and graphics to illustrate it. Those particular ones are, it's a Mayor Johnson symbol system and it's the one that's used most widely nationally. 
so we've got this structure. We know what we're going to do. That's uh, and we're going to tell other people what we're going to do before we do it. So that's making the implied structure explicit. And finally, we want to announce the structure at the beginning and the middle and reinforce throughout. So we are about to move on from our culture of inclusion to inclusive services, but not quite yet. Because we still have um, sensory regulation to talk about. Uh, many people, we all experience the world differently, right? Some of us um, pay attention to things that other people don't, or some of us are distracted by things that other people don't even know exist. So the classic example of this might be a fan in a room, like an air conditioning fan or a, a heating vent, the whoosh of noise from a heating vent. Uh, I just tune that out. My husband, he hears that and it can be distracting for him. Um, noise, light, flickering, there's all kinds of, um, uh, textures, things that people respond differently to. So how do we help, uh, how do we make sure that everybody's, that the library is a comfortable sensory environment for all of our patrons? We provide them with some tools, right? So people who are sensory seeking, right? Um, we can provide fidgets and, oh, I've got lots of fidgets here. Um, I've got my bristle blocks, which we showed you earlier. This is a pop sleeve. Um, my particular favorite is this squishy, um, it's hard to see, I know, but it's a it's a caterpillar um, and it's squishy and it pulls and I just love the way it feels. Anyway, I've got others. But those are fidgets and they help me sit still, which I have a really hard time doing. Um, move, providing activities for movements like that young man in my story time who paced around the back. Normally when I'm presenting, I'm standing up, I've got a lapel mic and I'm moving around it. That's much easier for me. And finally, noise, trying to minimize um, background noise, uh, or, or, or for some people they need noise, right? So maybe they're wearing headphones that have a white noise in them or something else while they're doing other things. But we have people who are sensory avoiding um, and those same headphones can be used to cancel the noise around the noise canceling headphones. And that's what the ones th that I'm wearing actually do because I'm in a shared office and there's a lot of things happening around me. That glare that people get in the library sometimes uh, is less with LED lights than with fluorescent lights, but it's still there. So you could provide sunglasses or baseball caps um, in, in sensory kits or at your reference desk for people who uh, need that. And having a quiet space in your libraries, because a lot of, uh, we don't, the libraries are not the quiet spaces mm -hmm. that they used to be, and that's a good thing. Um, but some people need or want a quiet space, and we should provide that, or spaces or times, whatever you can do. So keeping in mind when we're thinking about people with disabilities that cookie cutters are for baking. As I said earlier, you never assume um, because of the way a person looks or acts or interacts with you that they have a disability, that they don't. If, if they tell you that they have a disability, if they self-identify, you still can't assume what they need because what one person who's blind needs is not what another person who's blind needs. Um, always let the child do it, whether or not they have a disability, right? If there's this, this thing we want we focus on the product, but what's important is the process of creating the product um, or finding the book or whatever. So coaching a child, supporting them, giving them the tools they need, they need, but letting them do it themselves. When you're planning for library services or programs, plan a variety of skill levels and be flexible, right? This isn't about us. Remember, this is about our patrons, the people that we serve. And again, let go of your ego because it is not um, about us. And uh, there are two illustrator illustrations on this page. One is a cookie cutter with a slash through it, and the other, you know, no cookie cutters here. And then the other is a um, a pin from the San Francisco Public Library that says, "Attitudes are the real disabilities," and that's attributed to Henry Holbrook. So, how do we do this at Inclusive Services in about five minutes? So, we have programs for children's programs for adults. We do it with our collections. Um, through staff training and through outreach. And of all of those, outreach is the most important because people with disabilities and parents, children with disabilities and youth with disabilities have been rejected uh, and are used to being rejected and not accepted and people not being able to make, meet their needs, right? So they don't necessarily think of the library as the first place to go or even the 15th place to go, right? Why would I go to the library if I'm struggling with reading, right? Why would I go to the library with my son who makes funny noises funny noises in quotes, um, and we'll just be told to leave, right? So my job is to invite individuals 
and families one at a time to come to the library. And we do that in a variety of ways. So we have programs for youth where we make, um, now the first thing you see there is, it was a program on music and sound. It was a STEM program on sound. And we made the sound waves visible using um, an eye, uh, using earbuds, sand, um, and a cup with um, covered with cellophane. And the earbud earbuds made the sand dance. It was great. Um, we have a gardening program. Um, it's that next picture. As you can see, you can't really see, but um, the garden, it's it's in full, full bloom. Um, we have planting beds at three different heights. We have different types of tools. Um, and it's a wide enough path and a hard enough path that people who use wheelchairs and walkers can navigate it. Um, that next picture is of a STEM program. It, it's a maker program, but this particular one was an unmaker space. Um, and here they are taking apart a computer CPU. It's a bunch of um, teenagers uh, and they are using different tools and looking at it in different ways. And they're talking it through with their instructor. One of uh, the next space, the next one on the second level on the left is an, another makerspace program. And here we um, we sewed, it was a sewing program, right? And I had these like five guys and they're like, oh, I've never sewed before. I've always wanted to sew. So we made different things. And that young man is showing you what he made. Um, and he had different tools to do it. He had large needles and small needles and needles that you actually squeeze more like a stapler kind of a thing. And there were different materials so that, um, you know, people would, who were maybe had a sensory aversion to one material could use another. There were all different ways that we did that. That next picture is a picture of our adaptive gaming arcade, where again, there's multiple types of um, controllers. The games themselves are selected so that a variety of different type, for a variety of different needs. We have games that a blind person can play because we rely on, on text and not the visuals, the audio and not the visuals. Um, we have uh, games, single player games, multiple player games, all different kinds of things. And then finally, that's that last picture is of our virtual gardening program. Um, of course, we went virtual during the pandemic. And that is, ah, that is a Dean Richardson who had set up that program earlier, the Caps for Sale program. And she is <coughs> demonstrating planting with scissors. And she had a uh, with uh, traditional squeeze pincer grip scissors. She had other types of scissors there that she demonstrated um, how to take the plant out of the cup. She did it in a variety of different ways. And you see the subtitles at the bottom of her screen, her Zoom screen. Uh, and she also had a picture schedule that was hard to see. We offer programs for adults on uh, exceptional parenting, sort of all aspects of it, right? So uh, we do a monthly program. We bring an a advocate in who she talks with parents one-on-one -on, -one on the difficulties they're having in the education system with the social services or just with their child and how to get support, how and where to get support and help. Um, the next is sort of our general logo, disability rights or, or civil rights for these workshops. Um, then there's an example of a Spanish language flyer, um, Educación Especial Transport, uh, Special Education Transportation, Transportation and how to make it work. In a large city like New York, it's not sort of self, never was self-evident and it's gotten much, much worse since the pandemic. Um, below those three posters are, uh, is a picture of um, uh, one of our resource fairs on the plaza of our central library. Um, and what you don't see in this picture are the two ramps on the side of the plaza that are built into the plaza. Um, so it's fully accessible physically accessible. Um, the tents give us some sensory accessibility and there's a lot of other things going on there too, including sign language and Spanish interpreters. Um, and finally, um, the final flyer is for our school to prison, interrupting the school to prison pipeline. That was a conference we did uh, in 2019, just before the pandemic. Um, and the reason that it's here and the reason that we did the conference is when you look at the school to prison pipeline um, and what you see is that the children who end up suspended most often and disciplined most often, they are uh, children of color, particularly black and Hispanic, mostly male. But um, if you actually look at the discrepancies, um, it is 10, for example, black girls are 10 times more likely to be uh, suspended from school than white girls uh, for mostly things like dress code violations. Um, and uh, black students, Black male students are 
four times more likely to be suspended from school than their white counterparts. And again, um, so what you see there is discrepancies within discrepancies by gender. And then um, when it comes to disabilities, it's across the board, 80, somewhere between 80 and 92% of people who are disciplined in schools and suspended and who end up um, in that pipeline have disabilities of one kind or another, and their needs are not met in schools. So this conference was in part about how to get those needs met. It was in part about how to, um, what to do if your child has is, is in that system, if they have a connection with the juvenile justice system, juvenile justice system, quotes again. And then on the other end, how do we help families, uh, how do we help students and children who are coming out of detention and, and with reentry services? Okay, so, um, our programs all exist because of the power of partnerships. We have sensory friendly movies um, called with, we partner with Music for Autism. Um, there is a picture of one of our concerts there. Those movies were, um, went online, those, I'm sorry, the concerts went online when the pandemic began and they've been very popular. Um, Voices of Power is our uh, self-advocacy group that meets in the library met before the pandemic in the library and it's going to be meeting again after. Um, and these are self-advocates, uh, young adults with develop with all types of disabilities, also developmental though, um, who come together, they plan programs, they talk, they tell us what they wanna find out more about. They were uh, very helpful when we were redesigning our central library. Um, they met with us and talked through the designs and things like that. Um, and then of course, during the pandemic, every, the, we, there were other, uh, with lots of other partnerships too, um, including with Planned Parenthood, and that's a three-way partnership with the Voices of Power. We've done some great online and in-person workshops for them. And advocacy agencies like Include NYC, and that's a picture of the Include table at one of our fairs. Um, outreach, again, as I said, we have to invite people one-on-one. -on -one. So we have a program where we go into the hospitals and medical settings, um, we read to children, we give them free books, that's being reimagined in light of the pandemic, but we're working on it. Um, that's our hospital storytelling program. We have our kids mobile, which you saw at the beginning, and that's a book mobile for children. Um, but the main thing is that we really adhere to the embedded librarian model, right? We are not here to tell people what we offer. We're here to find out what people want um, and to design those services and programs and materials with them in mind. So you see a, a picture of uh, three of us at a fair there, and then you see a picture of, um, three of us winning an award for from a self-advocacy organization, the Brooklyn Family Support Services Council for our work with the disability community. And at the center of everything is the lived experience, right? Uh, at the people with this, nothing about us without us, the people with disabilities are designing services with us. They're parents too, but primarily we're focusing on the individuals with disabilities. So um, there's Marilyn Russo, Harold Russo there. She is, uh, that's at the book party for the launch of her book. Um, his name is escaping me, sorry. Uh, and then that is Trina Hazel and she was Miss Wheelchair, New York State. And she is one of the co-conveners of the Voices of Power group. Below that, we have a performance of a, an inclusive theater company at the Red Hook Library and the actors, at all of the theater. The director has a disability, the actors have disabilities, it's great. And then next to that is a picture of a Music for Autism concert with one of our volunteers in the yellow um, t-shirt there and she is a wheelchair user. So here are some resources. Um, I'm not gonna talk these through because you'll have them on your slides and on the handouts. Um, but for, uh, I threw in virtual accessibility because that's so new to most of us. And that's my contact information, uh, Carrie Banks. Uh, my phone number is 917-751-4890. And my email is cbanks at bklynlibrary.org. And if some questions, um, I'd love to hear them. Thank you so much, Carrie. This is amazing. Um, so much good information. Um, I know that, you know, already uh, my colleague Valerie was talking specifically about how much she loves the idea of the checkout sensory kits. Oh, nice. um, 
I love the hospital story time or the storytelling. Um, so we're asking people to um, put some of that in the chat, you know, what has uh, standing out to them from your presentation. Um, and then just for the folks in the audience, we are almost at time, but please keep putting your questions in the chat and anything we don't get to, we will certainly uh, forward those questions yes. to Carrie. Okay, so there was one question, let me see. Uh, Marissa wants to know, do you have any other examples of multiple means of representation you've done for other picture books? Uh you can adapt just about any picture book um, and just pull the stuff off the shelves. Um, hey, pizza, hey, pizza man, I think, where pizza, he hands up, uh, pizza delivery person ends up being different kinds of animals. You can pull your stuffed animals, your plushed animals um, from the shelves or using different kinds of ingredients. Um, I, when I do the very, uh, oh, Little Red Hen, when I tell that story, I always make sure that I have, um, piece of bread that I have some some representation I get wheat from the uh, flower store um, and I show them how to take the wheat berries out what the wheat berries look like and then I have flour so that um, I make it very tactile um, mm -hmm. we always always whatever we do we have a song um, and a movement activity around the book Mm -hmm. So um, this is the way we make the bread. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not going to sing for you, but <laughs> and and we throw the kneading motions in there, right? So, so you can adapt any book, or you can use any book mm -hmm. in this way. Excellent, thank you. Jessica wants to know uh, about music for autism concerts. Mm -hmm. Is the music less loud? How does how does that work? Um, it's. Well, first of all, we, we encourage people to use their noise canceling headphones if they want to. Um, we let them, we encourage them to move around, to dance or not dance. Um, we have food there. Uh, the lights are on, um, but, but softly, but we don't turn the lights off. Um, the performers tell people what to expect. We have uh, the, the picture schedule of the concerts. We have a regular structure for each concert. Um, so because we know that one adaptation is not going to make them friendly for everybody. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, and no, the music isn't necessarily less loud because remember some of our, some of our uh, audience are sensory seekers, right? Mm -hmm. They're looking for that loud music, but if it's going to be loud music, we let people know. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. So, and I, I just want to throw out one thing. I heard myself say adapt a book um, at inclusive services and good practice is not to adapt anything, right? You use all of these tools to plan, plan your programs, plan your services in advance so that you're not scrambling at the math minute um, to say, oh my God, the blind kid came, what am I gonna do? Mm -hmm. You need to have already prepared for that mm -hmm. child. Yeah, it's another excellent point and uh, specifically about how we use language, right? Yeah. Uh, Caitlin is asking, can you share any examples of times when planning included both library employees and library users accessibility needs? All of my planning does that. Um, if I'm gonna have, if we're gonna start a new program, I, I go to the community. I, first of all, it's likely that the idea for the program came from the community, right? That's that embedded librarian thing. I'm not taking to them what we're doing. I'm asking them what you want me to do. Um, well, one, one example, which is actually not about disability issues, but um, I went to a conference 40 to none, and it was a conference of uh, teens experiencing homelessness. And it was called 40 to none because 40% of teens who are experiencing homelessness are on the LGBTQ spectrum. So I went to this conference and it was wonderful. Um, and Cindy Lauper was there, at Cindy Lauper. Um, and, uh, but mostly I met a lot of teens, um, LGBTQ teens who had experienced or were experiencing homelessness. So I've said, I got up at the end, I introduced myself and I said, what do you need to make libraries comfortable for you? so that you will come in and use our libraries. And two things, they needed two things. They needed gender neutral bathrooms and they needed um, charging stations. Mm. So that was, um, both of those were already on my radar, but when this came up, I really started pushing. Um, and now all of our libraries, that was a few years ago, it took us a while, but now all of our 68 locations have a gender, at least one gender neutral bathroom and we are um, working in the charging stations. As I think a lot of them, if not most of them have them now. 
Yeah, absolutely. All right, so we are at time. I know there are two or three more questions uh, in the chat box. We will certainly send them to Carrie and hopefully we can get Thank them you. up uh, on the website along with the recording. Please everyone join me in thanking Carrie for an amazing session, so much good information uh, and really you know, emphasizing this idea um, that it, inclusive services is just what we should be doing, right? So love that last point you made about we're not adapting. This is the work that we should be doing. Thank you. Uh, I just want to respond to one thing I saw in the chat. Somebody yeah. mentioned that they got a grant to do some yeah. some program. I don't know for what, but um, that's great. I'm really happy you did. But again, this should be part of planning your services like you plan everything else, right? When you're buying your craft supplies, you buy the thin crayons, right? And you buy the thicker crayons. Mm -hmm. Same time, mm -hmm. same thing. Um, and, and same with your building designs and everything else. This needs, to, we don't have... Uh, staff budget meetings where we say, oh, we don't have enough money to support women in the library, the books that women like, and the women's bathrooms. So we're just not going to do that this year because we don't have enough money, right? So we can't say that about mm -hmm. people with disabilities either. So um, I'm glad you got the money. I'm glad you're doing something. But again, I want us to just change our mindset just that little bit. Yeah. So and thank you all for coming this is awesome this yeah is really great harry we had 101 people nice. um, and so i'm just uh, so glad so grateful for the work that you do and grateful that you are willing to share with us so thanks so much again for joining us and to the folks in the audience uh, as always, thank you so much for spending some time with us. Mm -hmm. uh, and next week we will have Kate Reynolds, who is known as the Lavender Librarian uh, mm -hmm. and runs Storytime Solidarity. So I think that'll have a lot of uh, synergies with what Carrie spoke about today. So everyone, thank you so much. Enjoy your evening, enjoy your week, and we hope to see you for the next Critical Conversation on Thursday, September 29th. Thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.